included into Mesolithic text Septuagint and Bible. Those reflected both, both Hellenistic, Judaic, and Christian ideas are called intertestamental. In these terms, they very, the very title of my paper seems paradoxical. In the biblical canon in Rus, uh, in, in Rus, uh, in Old Rus, I published this paper a year ago in the uh, I pointed out creation of quasi-biblical writings as one of the elements of the specific treatment of canon by the Slavs. These writings demonstrate all literary features typical of Apocrypha. They are have a plot. They involve biblical characters and biblical events. They contain ideas and facts that supplement the biblical story. These features are fully present in the three old Russian texts I am to analyze. The first, the massacre of the innocents, or uh, uh, I, uh, another uh, title I prefer, Levi Apocrypha. The story is well known. It is one of the interpolations within the Slavic version of the Jewish law and the tale of Aphrodite. It is included in my catalog of interpolation of the Jewish law under numbers 73 and 74. It contains two parts. The first part relate, relates events of the uh, 37 year uh, before the common era when here took Jerusalem after a uh, six months long siege and had members of the Sanhedrin slaughtered because they opposed him. This event, briefly mentioned by Josephus in Antiquities, is provided by these explanatory details. The Sanhedrin opposes Herod because he treats Herod as a foreigner and a, a man of a different face without any right to the Judean throne. Besides, he cannot be recognized as the Messiah. There have been no expected signs mentioned in Matthew uh, following Isaiah. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and so on. The Sanhedrin's position is made known to Herod by one of its unworthy members, who name, whose name Levi, hence the massacre. It was a reason of the Messiah. It is known that the Slavic version of the Jewish war, together with the Slavic version of the Chronicles of John Malala, were combined in the East Slavic chronographer called Judea. And as it was necessary to bring the interpolation into accordance with the chronology of the Chronicles of John Malala, the Sanhedrin's plot and its massacre were dated 32 years before for being uh, 30, 32 years be, um, uh, instead of 37. The second part inter interprets Matthew, the chapter 2, um, again introducing additional details. The Magi tell about themselves that it, it has taken them a year and a half to get to Judea, that they are professional astrologers and have never made a mistake. They are test arrested and guarded by men who understand Persian and can follow their conversation. All suspicions regarding the Machi as, mm, mm, are lifted and they are allowed to go on their way, following the star. Herod himself demonstrates piety and worship the God for the possibility to see the negative star. The adoration of the Magi is not mentioned. The council of chief priests and teachers of the law gather to interpret the appearance of the star, uh, mm, uh, to, to interpret the appearance of the star does not take place after their arrival, and appear, uh, this uh, session doesn't take place after the arrival of the Magi, but after their departure which allows Levi, the same Levi, to be included among the members with his evil advice. The council decided that it is necessary to find a father 
fatherless baby, boy. Um, um, as a result of new mistake in, in harmonization and the chronologies of Malaras and Jewish law, the, this episode is dated 22 years, 22 years. And uh, because of legal um, advice of Levy, uh, he wrote, um, uh, killed um, uh, some thousand boys, uh, children, and um, so Levy was again um, the reason of this massacre. This new massacre. Two chronological mistakes show that the two stories in their origin were independent of the chronograph. They are two features, uh, they are, there are two features that allow us to unite these two stories separated in the text of chronograph by some other events from the Roman as heroes history. Uh, this feature, mm, the first the identity of the clothes, and the second, presence of this lady playing the same part, playing the same part in the two <coughs> episodes. As a literary character, he bears resemblance with the Magus Valaam from the apocryphal Lady of Moses. The event, uh, which has but a minor importance in the Christian perspective, which is unknown to the Jewish world and chronicles, and is associated, is accorded just a brief mention in the antiquities, the event of massacre of uh, Saturday. Here is compared, uh, is compared to the massacre of the innocent, innocents. Members of Sanhedrin who died in 73 years yet are turned in this text into new Maccabean martyrs, dying from the, from, for their face. They are particularly for runners of the massacred innocents the first truly Christian martyr. The blame for the massacre of the innocents is lifted from the Jewish people and Judaism and is placed on the renegade who also caused damage to the Jewish society, that is Levi. Um, Joseph's assessment of heroes in this episode is not the same. Josephus does not give any details about the massacre of the Sanhedrin in his, mm, in his antiquities because he was actions to justify Herod, Herod's political curse. Thanks to each, Judea had very comfortable relations with Rome, enjoying peace and considerable degree of independence. To create a text of this kind, it was not enough just to be acquainted with the antiquities. They also had to be well aware of the character of the Sanhedrin as an organ of theocracy at the time of Maccabees, to have a mature opinion of Herod and his role in the history, to know about his followers, uh, for, about his followers attempt, attempts to present him as a messiah. Uh, the general term of this text being Christian we still may point out some compromise, some intertestament, intertestament, intertestament element. Thus, the Slavic text does not use the term, the terms Christos or Messiah or Mashiach, after appearing in all Russian texts, but it used a very rare term, Pamazanik, Slavonic term, Pamazanik. Um, um, uh, which, uh, according to material of Selesnevsky, cites it only twice as David habitual epithet. And only in the 7th century it is used of the Moscow Select. In keeping with the Judaic interpretation in the mention of the fa fatherless baby, the baby of doubt, um, doubtful provenance, Manza, is one of the topics of Judaic and anti-Christian pamphlets Toledo to Yeshua. The literary form of the apocryphon is similar to the rewritten Bible or Targum. 
All this can be hardly expected of an old Russian writer who might acquire basics of Christian education in Byzantium if he wished it, but who was unlikely to learn any details of the Judaic history and ideology. The second, apocryphal, the tale of three conquests on Jerusalem. You see, the right I uh, give uh, 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 list of sources for every item. Uh, this classic biblical story was first made known by Eastern in the beginning of the 20th century, according to manuscript Academic Chronograph. The tale describes this siege and three conquests of Jerusalem by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, then the Syrian king Antiochus of Epiphanes, and by the Roman emperor Titus and Titus. The tale had as its source George Hamartos Chronicle, Alexandria, biblical books, historical compositions, um, Yosipon and the Jewish book. Uh, or Yahmir, also. In the Academic Chronicle mm, uh, mm, described by history, the second episode is borrowed from Yosipon or the Chronicles of Yahmir, the third episode from the Jewish War in its Slavic translation. Some manuscripts, uh, for example, the Ellen's Kiri Le pieces, uh, borrowed uh, this episode of, mm, of Titus' conquest from Joseph. We cannot say which source was primary, which, suppl which supplanted it later, until the Slavic manuscript tradition has been fully studied. But given the authority and popularity of the Slavic translation of the Jewish war by Joseph, it is most unlikely that it would be replaced by some other text. So we may assume that the Josephon, uh, Josephon made part of the initial text of the tale. From the literary point of view, the tale is characterized as integrity. Its principal message is that the, posterity, uh, that the prosperity and the safety of the city depend on the preservation of the true faith. The third plot is a uh, comedy of the blessed Jer uh, Zerubarium. It is first discovered by, uh, discovered by Sabalevsky and published recently in, uh, some years ago. It is composed of two uh, parts. The first part uses the story about three bodyguards of Darius, of the King Darius. Uh, it, it part is uh, known from the Second or first, as uh, in, in different traditions, this book has different numbers. Um, yeah, the dispute was about what one thing is strongest, and the Bazarbaber uh, was a winner who is awarded with, the, uh, with this, the right to restore the temple. This concise story was translated from the, uh, from the Hebrew original, which is indicated by the presence of Hebraisms in Slavic texts. For example, uh, Cyrus, or Cyrus, the um, uh, Persian king, who is, uh, has a um, name of Koresh. Sidonians uh, are called Tzidiani. The second part is borrowed, uh, the second part of the apocryphon borrowed from the Slavic version of the Jewish war um, and tells the story of the temple's destruction. As a whole, the homily, the homily in its structure is similar to the Slavic, uh, to the, mm, sorry, to the, Sla to the Sa second Esther, which combines passages relating the story of the Republic from Ezra Nehemiah and other sources. Uh, uh, the two parts of all these uh, uh, parts of um, uh, all these apocryphas 
um, made after the model of the of book of Ezra. Now we can uh, see the structure of book Ezra. Ezra Aleph in Septuagint, the um, third Ezra in Vulgate, and second Ezra is Slavonic. You see the uh, book of Ezra consists of two, uh, uh, of eight different um, uh, parts, um, borrowed from different sources. Uh, one of them is uh, the story of the Rubabit and the, the Darius bodyguards. Uh, so the same uh, structure is used for this three uh, Slavonic compositions. Uh, it is, uh, you see, the uh, three Slavonic compositions give a new, um, in, in, a new uh, vision of the material. I, the about the uh, Levi Apocrypha I said, about the two other, we find, uh, as the first time, we find the history of the Jerusalem as a special topic and the history of the temple as a special topic. It is strange that no Bible book contains another history of um, Jerusalem, no history of temple. And these two mm, the topics was first, as the first time um, described by uh, uh, in Old Rush, in, in Old Rush, uh, a million later. The, this evident gap was filled somebody in all those. Uh, the final line of um, the homily of um, Blaise Zerubabel, now you, um, you can see in, uh, it is the second uh, in my uh, I give the uh, English translation of this. Perceive brothers, God's strength, <coughs> his breath against the city. And what city was so strong, or had so many people, or so brave people? There is no other city in the world as strong and as impregnable as Jerusalem. There were 12, 12 walls around the city. And so brave men were in it that one came out against the hundred and came back to the city unharmed. Once, when Titus besieged Titus besieged the city, oh, lo, then seven heroes came out and cut seven streets through the Roman army, reaching Titus himself, and all. Mm, uh, but took him a prisoner and came back unharmed. Perceive the strength. But be they able to move the mountains, nothing is possible for a man without God's help. The summary has an its source in episode described in well, uh, described in Joseph and the place in tale of the confess of Jerusalem. You see, it is the first, la the first um, line give uh, the source of this um, long um, uh, <coughs> and the, uh, the, the third, um, it is, uh, the, the third is, um, uh, the, the, um, sorry. This remark was uh, borrowed by um, in the Novgorodian letterpiece in, in the year of um, in the second part of the 14th century. So on my um, uh, it is it is short time, so I have to give a resume. Uh, the two historical stories um, about the fate of the temple and Jerusalem have no direct indication that they are Christian in their origin, or that they polemize, polemize with Judaism, <coughs> which is obvious in such Islamic polemic treatise as a 
works for sale profits and explanatory polia. Uh, neither are they anti Christian. They presume continuity of the religious tradition, continuity between Judaism and Christianity. They interconnection. Even comparatively moderate criticism of Judaism found in Metropolitan Hilarion, Sermon on Law and Grace based on Kabbalah um, would have been inappropriate here. The idea that as long as the Jews worshipped God, they were invincible, which ends the homily of the blessed Zerubbabel, does not differ from the appeal for repentance and conversion to God, which runs through all the letter pro prophets from Amos to Deuteronomy. Isaiah. Together with Apocryphon about Levi, this material reveals quite liberal religious environment that existed in the world of these Slavic scribes. In order to explain this phenomenon, we must say a few words about the historical and literary background of the Sea of Africa. Despite all attempts, Byzantium failed to, in, to entice Rus into the anti-Catholic campaign. There appeared no original anti-Catholic writings in this, only translation from Greek probably ordered by the Greek Kiva Metropolitans. But relation with it, Judaism were confirmed in the writing in three groups of sources. The first group, original polemics, I mean words of the same prophets, Snovisasvetik Prorok and explanatory Paria. The second group, translation of Haggadic stories and parables from the Talmud and the Midrashim. I mean Solomon cycles and the life of Moses and some of the sources. The third group, Glosses extracted from Masoretic texts and Palestinian Targum together with Parashot in the copies of Slavonic Pentateuch. Existence of all these sources is due to the presence of Jews among the East Slavs. The three apocrypha analyze about uh, form one more group of sources whose appearance should be explained in the same way. Text peculiarities clearly seen in the apocrypha about Levi lead us to presume some kind of Judeo-Christian cooperation in the process. We have no historical evidence in favor of this hypothesis, but we may take into account what we know about the comparatively, the comparatively compar compar contemporary situation in Europe. In the 11th and 12th century, there were quite a number of monks who studied Hebrew and incorporated into their writings reflection of Judaic theology. They were Ebo Siegel of the Saint Florian in Abbey in Anjou, Stephen Hardin above Sito, three prominent figures of monastic scholarship of an um, Abbey of Saint Victor in Paris, Huber. Um, uh, Richard and, and Andrew. Peter Comesta, one of the founders of the University of Paris. Stephen Langton, rector of the university. And some other, and um, not, uh, uh, some other, and many people, uh, names, it, it is possible. Uh, the long accumulation of knowledge resulted in of knowledge resulted in Postele, Perpetua of Nicolas de Lira in the 14th century. It was a principal Christian commentary on, on the Bible in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, which absorbed the entire learning of Rashid and his school. It is known that the process involves personal communication of Christian and rabbinic scholars. The results of East European cooperation were less impressive. From one side, East European Christian education could not demand much of such collaboration. From the other side, Jewish population among Slavs was few and sparse. The considerable linguistic similarity of, four, of all four groups of sources 
shows that they originated in one place approximately at the same time. It could be Kiev and Galicia on the eve of Mongolian invasion. The results of the work were preserved in the northeastern Rus, where explanatory Polya might have been compiled, and large scale work on, on chronography began. Interest towards this genre found identical realization in Peter Conister Historica Scholastica, Historia Scholastica. As distinct from Western Europe, polemic parts of um, um, explanatory period do not show any acquaintance with rabbinic sources. Um, um, this means that their authors um, uh, were not converts. Yes. Which was not, um, which was the case in Judeo-Christian polemics in Europe. Thus, the name anti-Jewish Slavonic works was nothing more than a literary form of antithesis. Religious tolerance seems to have been characteristic of nomadic empires and was inherited and preserved on East Slavic territories throughout the pre-Mongolian epoch. Besides the East Slav, Slavic vernacular used by every, for everybody purposes by Jews made them bearers of the same cultural pattern, but not strangers. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think we have much time for discussion, but at least we can, we can ask questions. Are there any questions? Yes, please. Concerning the homily of the blessed Zerubbabel, I wasn't sure whether you said that it was their Hebraisms, which means it was translated from Hebrew. But has the Hebrew text been preserved partially or fully? Okay. And is there any connection textual to the apocalypse of Zerubbabel, the earlier Jewish apocalypse? No, no, no. no. It is as, uh, absolutely um, the same text as uh, included in the. As, uh, the Ezra. So it's a laboration on Ezra? Yeah, it, no, it is, it, it, it was, uh, the source, the direct source was the chronics of Yerach Mail. Small questions, please. No questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Christfried Betri from the University of Greifer. Mephisedek among Russian saints, the discussion about the Jewish Christian history of Mephisedek. Yes, I have a presentation as well. You do something that's one to help you to stop it. Presentation has pictures. So, what can we do? Yes, I can promise you some nice pictures from the Yeah, yeah, nice pictures. Turn it back on. Turn it on. Just let it run down and then start. Come back again. Yeah. It will come back. It will resurrect. Okay. Like Isaac. So, should I start revising that? They said do it now.
Melchizedek leaves his clothes behind and flees naked. When he asks God for help, the earth opens up and the entire town with the crowd gathered for the sacrifice is swallowed up. Terrified by this divine judgment, he climbs Mount Tabor and hides there in the bush and in a cave. Years later, God sends Abraham to Mount Tabor at the bottom. Abraham calls man of God three times. Melchizedek appears as a wild man. Abraham follows God's order and cuts Melchizedek's hair and nails, gives him clothes and feeds him. And Melchizedek blesses Abraham. Both of them sacrifice and bread and wine to God of Abraham's fight with the kings, which brings the story back to the text of the Bible. Perhaps it is enough for the context. My second point is uh, Jewish uh, about the origins of the story. Jewish exegesis and the enigma of Genesis 14. The history of Melchizedek goes back to a Jewish apocrypha, I think. The major arguments for that are the following. All the Christian elements in the story can easily uh, be, uh, can easily be identified as secondary. They openly contradict the structure and the intention of the basic story. The relation to Hebrews uh, 7.3 has to be considered one of the most obvious indications. It is simply impossible to harmonize the information that Melchizedek is without father, without mother and without genealogy <coughs> with a detailed story about his father, his mother, brother, and ancestors. This is, if I may say so, a real flop of the Christian editor. <laughs> the same applies to all the typological references to the Eucharist. The core of the history of Melchizedek makes no such references and has no reason to do so. But when we look for a suitable context, we find the nearest parallels in Jewish speculations about Melchizedek. The main interest of Jewish exegesis to interpret uh, Genesis 14 is the question, how can a Canaanite be a priest of God Most High? There are usually two answers. The first is Melchizedek was no Canaanite, but then son of Noah. Noah, the priest, according to Genesis 9.27. And the second answer is, Melchizedek was really a Canaanite, but he abandoned idolatry and found his way individually to the one God, the creator of heaven and earth. It is precisely this second answer which is found in the little story and which is unfolded there in a narrative way. The most direct reference, uh, references were taken by the author from the Jewish Abraham tradition. They are the renunciation of idolatry, the true insight into God, and the permanent threat of death for the confessor, confessor. So Melchizedek appears, you can say, like a twin brother in spirit of Abraham. Their encounter is based on the affinity of their stories. When they meet each other, when they meet each other, some kind of mutual authorization takes place. Of uh, special interest uh, is Melchizedek's Tupas. The biblical model mm -hmm. in Genesis 14, Psalm 110 or Hebrews stresses one Tupas, the Tupas of a priest and king, which is carefully maintained uh, and only slightly modified throughout the whole uh, Melchizedek tradition <coughs> of Jews and Christians. It is a proprium of the history of Melchizedek to depict its hero in a totally different way, namely as a hermit, a hermit on Mount Tabor. But what it is about the hermit in the wilderness, does he live an ascetic life like the fathers in the desert? 
or can it strictly be explained otherwise? As for me, it is much more convincing to understand Melchizedek's typos in this story as that of a Nazirite. I gave all the details here in my paper uh, and also some other arguments for its Jewish origin, but now I want to leave it aside. Only some words uh, concerning the date of the story is difficult uh, to fix a date, but using some grids of different criteria to make the fo focus sharper, we have good arguments, I think, uh, for a time between the first and the third century uh, of the Christian era. My third point uh, is concerning affinities. Uh, affinities between Christian asceticism and the Melchizedek figure uh, on the Mount Table. When Christian uh, recipients adopted the history of Melchizedek, there was good reason for them to put it under the authority of Athanasius. From the 4th century onward, it seemed natural to understand Melchizedek's long-term stay in the isolation of Mount Tabor as a type of ascetic life. And for ascetic biographies, Athanasius was the best at first because of his influential Vita Antoni. So the little novel about Melchizedek started its Christian career under the label of a just awaking, fascinating and flourishing ideal, the anchorite piety and lifestyle. At first glance, there are a lot of ascetic associations uh, in the story. When the hero of this narrative withdraws from his own <coughs> life, he adopts the habit of a wild man. Melchizedek does not only abandon cutting his hair and nails, he also takes off his clothes and remains naked as when he emerged from his mother's womb. His appearance becomes animal-like, with long hair and claws and a back like a tortoise shell, this is written in the text. In absolute isolation, he nourishes himself with berries, herbs and dew only. This is a picture much more radical than that of the Desert Fathers. Nevertheless, in Syria or Egypt we can find some ascetic movements with similar practices. Ironias and Thosomenos, for example, uh, refer to a certain group called the Boskoi, living naked in the mountains and pasturing themselves like cattle on the meadow. There are related phenomena in the Egyptian tradition as well. Obviously, the hermit Melchizedek could be seen here as a congenial typos. In such a context, there was no alternative but to understand the intended, the originally intended Nazirite now as an anchorite. For the Roman centuries, the ascetic ideal became one of the guiding images of, for, for the Christian piety, which offered the general key for the narrative of the history of Melchizedek now. The ascetic interpretation of the story was the most important precondition for its popularity and spread in the Christian East. So the history of Melchizedek was well prepared among the bulk of other apocryphal material in the Byzantine literature for a transfer into the Slavic cultural sphere. And this is my fourth point. This fascination, Slavic hagiography and the hermit priest king. When the Slavs started to create their own literature, most of the texts were translated at the beginning from Byzantine manuscripts. Alongside the books necessary for liturgical services, there was a special interest in the in narrations useful for religious edification. Therefore, many apocrypha found their way into Slavic translation in spite of an already 
early established and continuously developed index prohibitorum. On this index, the history of Melchizedek is lacking throughout because it was unchallenged and protected by the name of Athanasius. The story came into the Slavonic language by two different translations. The first is the word Logos of Athanasius. Second is part of the Palea Historica, which was translated as a whole. Most widespread was the Athanasius version in the form of a separate article called Slogan of Athanasia. Uh, it entered into several new contexts manuscripts and became, for example, part of the Turkavaya Palea. There are also interconnections with the translated text of the Stovichiskaya Palea, which prove uh, a lively process of reception. Independently, the Roman literature knows some other traditions about Melchizedek, but none of them obtained such popularity as this story. There are at least three reasons for that. First, the little narration under the authority of our father Athanasius offered a biblical model for ascetic lifestyle, which had a great fascination from the very beginning of Slavic Christianity. I have an example of another naked ascetic father, uh, famous in the Russian tradition. Already at the time of the Kievan Rus and later uh, in several waves up to the last uh, flowering of the 18th century, the ascetic idea was popular for Christian self-definition in Eastern theology and piety. Second, there was a growing need in the hagiographic tradition for an appropriate story. The relevant collections included not only Old Testament men of God, uh, but also the so-called holy pagans and even Greek philosophers or other wise men in general. To commemorate them or to tell something about them was possible only on the basis of uh, biographic narration. But Genesis 14 or Hebrews uh, 7 are absolutely insufficient in this respect. They tell nothing besides name and function. The same lack of information concerning Melchizedek denotes apocryphal literature in general, except this history of Melchizedek. So the little story offered exactly what hagiography needed, namely a narration with genealogy, circumstances of life, a traumatic conflict, a turning point, and a description of the heroes paradigmatic importance at the end. On Slavic soil, the story was rearranged in a short version to meet the special need and uh, become an integral part of the so-called Prolog, following the model of the Byzantine Synaxarium. Here we have a lot of textual evidence, but perhaps the most interesting example is found in the Velitiumine Chetiki of Metropolitan Makari, working on a form of the church books he collected in his monumental reservoir of hagiographic traditions, assigning the text to the saints' commemoration days in the calendar. Under the date of May 22nd, he compiled several texts, beginning and ending twice with the history of Melchizedek, according to the short prolog version followed by the longer word of Athanasius, Bishop, Bishop of Alexandria, about Melchizedek. The Old Testament priest king has not only a place in the church's calendar of saints, but also a proper story to read on the day. And third, the history of, of Melchizedek was um, welcome as well in a homiletic perspective. Now, the hermit from the Mount Tabor advanced to example of conversion and repentance. This can be learned from uh, the context of some homiletic collections 
I think here we have um, tens of literal, literature still waiting for detailed studies. Finally, the history of Melchizedek found a form of reception in Slavonic literature which opens a new gate into Byzantine traditions. The long series of Russian pilgrimages to the Holy Land starts with the famous itinerary of Abbot Daniel in the 12th, beginning of the 12th century. When he describes Nazareth, he also mentions a visit to Mount Tabor. Occasionally, he notes not only the place of transfiguration, but also a little cave church where Melchizedek lived here long ago as a hermit in the wilderness. The question is whether about Daniel introduces into his description what he knows from the literature, whether he writes about what he has actually seen on his journey, or whether he connects his own thoughts and holy places with his scholarly knowledge. Anyway, for his Russian audience, the chapter about the cave church on Mount Tabor uh, was easy to understand because of the popularity of the related narrative. And you can visit the church up to date. My fifth and last point is about a new scholarly uh, discussion uh, of a long time forgotten text. After a century long sleep, the history of Melchizedek recently was awakened by the kiss of several scholars. But the main problem is still the same. We have dominant evidence for a Christian treatment of the story but its Jewish origins or roots are only the result of reconstruction. Arguments for an original Jewish or Christian character, therefore, have to be examined carefully. Major reasons for a Christian origin have already been proposed by Marcel Simon uh, in his inventive article of 1937. He identified at the time a monastic background and uh, um, and the monastic background behind the story as a whole, and the figure of John the Baptist as the closest analogy and obvious model for Melchizedek in particular. Regarding uh, my last three minutes, I jump over this uh, discussion of a monastic background and come to the relation between Melchizedek and John the Baptist, which uh, seems to me the most interesting. Uh, in Eastern uh, iconography or the iconographic uh, tradition, John the Baptist also appears as a wild man, partly naked and with long hair, living in the desert. <laughs> the Slavonic version of Josephus Benum Judaicum has consistently emphasized this picture of John the Baptist like a wild animal coming out of the forest. These are words uh, formulated there. Could it be a model for Melchizedek in our story? I think it is much easier to understand John the Baptist and the Melchizedek of our story originally as Messiah writes. John, as presented by the Synoptic Gospels, clearly lives uh, uh, as a long life Messiah. Luke adds the birth story exactly in line with the Old Testament model and ascribes to him priestly descendants. His Nazarite behavior is closely connected with priestly purity. But he is definitely not an ascetic. I think that is a consensus in New Testament scholarship. In my opinion, uh, the parallel between John and Melchizedek is that of developing Jewish narrative models in Christian interpretation, but not something like a genetic relation. So I come to the end. Uh, my last passage 
when the history of Melchizedek arrived in Slavic countries after hundreds of years, it had become a true Christian text. Meanwhile, it had undergone reshaping and recontextualization already in the Byzantine literature. This process continued when the narration became part of new context manuscripts like the Dorkova Yapalea, Prolog, the Chikimene, or several homiletic sponiki. But we can still follow its roots back to a basic story created in early Jewish uh, milieu. Many chain links in between have been lost, but there are still enough indications for this wide ranging transmission. Melchizedek started as a Nazarite, which explains how he could become a priest of God Most High, and he ended up as one of the holy pagans among Russian saints, commemorated in the Christian Orthodox Church calendar. To sum up, the history of Melchizedek proves how important interdisciplinary cooperation is in the field of apocrypha, especially concerning their transmission from Jews to Slavs. It would be a challenging and compelling project to collect all the witnesses to the history of Melchizedek in Slavonic translation in order to prepare a critical edition. Here, I think, scholarly work is still at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful combination of text and, and iconography. But I have two reasons for doubting the Jewish origins of this text. One is that as far as Mel Melchizedek as, an, as, a, as another believer without Abraham, there's a tradition in the, this contemporary time, in the Talmudic period, that says that, that Jacob was studying at the yeshiva of Shem and Eber. That means that there was another parallel tradition with Abraham of other believers and uh, uh, Jacob was, was, was part of that. So the crucial thing was there was a yeshiva, they were studying Torah. Then there's a story in the Talmud about a rabbi who's trying to escape from the Romans with the sun, lives in the cave, they're also naked, they bury themselves up to their neck in sand, and what do they do? They discuss Torah. So the crucial element in rabbinic texts of this time is that you have to discuss Torah if you're if you're going to be living in a cave, this is the crucial motif. We don't find this with Melchizedek, and therefore, and that, that's really the grounds why I would doubt the, uh, the Jewish origins of a text appearing at the, at the time when you, when you established. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, really the only open flag in my argumentation. Uh, if Melchizedek is really a uh, Nazarite, uh, there must be something like a foe, and we don't have this. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, yes? Uh, what is it? His occupation on Mount Table. What does uh, he do there? Uh, the story tells nothing about this. But uh, to make uh, an argument from the other side, the Christian interest in Melchizedek is, as far as I can see it, absolutely dominated by the Christological and by the Eucharistic. <coughs> Uh, to publish. There is no other interest than this one. Uh, Christian tradition has the classes of uh, Hebrews uh, on, and Melchizedek is only interesting because of uh, this Christological and Hebrewistic topology. So I think the, it is a more simple answer to say he has to clarify the problem how can uh, uh, a Canaanite become a priest of the time? And this is a clearly Jewish question and exegetic uh, tradition. Thank you very much, Chris, for your uh, presentation. First, I'd like to say that a good and brief counter argument Mark has said would be that you meant Jewish, not rabbinic. So, not the Jewish, not necessarily, should have all these values mentioned from later Greek sources. And <coughs> uh, the second thing I'd like to ask you did you consider relevant? By tracing the roots of this tradition, especially you define the motif as a wild man going out from the wood, uh, from the woods. Uh, uh, there's a realistic, realistic motif, very well developed, of wild, wild men. Mm -hmm. Also, we have wild men, half, half men, half, half the beasts, 
Christian and the death of the Santa is contaminated with satires and forms, but it's more than that, you know, when people not by the God but by like normal human beings, hairy and human goods. And also Jewish tradition shares Jewish tradition shares this motif in Mishnah, there's a discussion, very serious discussion where that wild man, Adonai Sadeh, a field man, can be considered human or beast. Uh, does anybody take them as existing creatures? I don't know, it's also very similar to modern mythology of this uh, big meat. Yeah, <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, point. I have collected uh, some traditions about wild <coughs> men, and you can say that it's something like an archetypical motif in the world literature. You can start uh, in the Gilgamesh epos, uh, for example, uh, or you can start with uh, the book of Daniel, the madness of Nebuchadnezzar, he becomes like an animal, uh, he's uh, he, he eating grass and, and so on, and you have it uh, down uh, to the medieval um, literature, um, the epics, uh, the knights' epics in the medieval literature, uh, Evai, uh, apples, for example, and so on. Uh, the, the hero is like an antitypos of the cultural world for a special time. And in this time, he uh, makes uh, experiences, uh, most experiences with God, and then he comes back to the civilized, civilized world and starts a new uh, career. It is a real motive you can follow through many, many texts in totally different cultures and, and times. I think uh, this is a, I want to say, this is a, this is a topology, um, I would say in English, the unterstützt, the, uh, which supports, which supports uh, this life of a Nazarite uh, in the wilderness of Mount uh, Tabor. I think uh, these both typologies are closest to the story and the third typology, that of an ascetic father, I think this is secondary. It became dominant in the end and was responsible for the widespread popularity, but I think uh, this, is, this is third motive and maybe secondary stage. But the Nazarite and white men are uh, interconnected with each other. We have time for three questions. Very good. I just wanted to ask, did you leave on purpose the uh, Mokisilek story from Enoch? You didn't want to touch it in the presentation. Uh, no, I didn't touch it. Uh, it is uh, such a phenomenon of uh, interrelation or intertextuality. Uh, the second Enoch uh, quotes this <coughs> history of Mokisilek. And um, the interesting question is, uh, does he quote uh, Slavonic text, or does it go Greek text in the time before the uh, translation into mm -hmm. Slavonic? This is difficult to answer. Uh, I tried to defend uh, the hypothesis that it was in the Greek mm -hmm. stage, but this a slippery ground, I know. Just because of the motif of the miraculous birth, that's why I was asking, which very well fits with your answer. Michael, please. Uh, just, just two little points of information. The great poet Georgios Humos, about 1600, has a wonderful form of this story with numerous, yes, they're from the Humos manuscripts from that time, yes, with, with many more pictures. So Thank you there much. are other copies. And there's a good edition of the text published by the Athens Academy. Yeah. You can get the Telling another final point, uh, I've got various forms of this story in the books that I more or less finished last night <laughs> of Armenian Abraham stories. And there are two major forms of the uh, story in there that vary in a number of ways from this historian. Thank you very much. These uh, pictures. Not the Armenian version of no. No, thank you. Uh, these pictures are from Humnos, from this poem. This poem is illustrated, and I have these. Uh, there are three manuscripts of this poem by 
Primus, and uh, I have the pictures from this. Uh, in one manuscript are 19 to this story, and about 10 or 12 uh, in another manuscript. <coughs> but the manuscript at all is illustrated. Yeah. By the way, there is an article from the manuscript made in 1953 in the National Library. It's a manuscript. Okay. And uh, another point with the Armenian tradition, uh, the story of the history of Melchizedek is part of the Armenian Synaxaria. In two, in two versions, and I think this is a starting point for the influence in this literature. I know, I'm Concerning the matter of Hegelian intertextuality, I was wondering whether you have found any sort of intertextual evidence of uh, evidence of intertextuality between this and this cycle. In the literature of this uh, semi mystical, semi magical Byzantine text, which contains practices for inducing visions, emulating the apocalyptic, prophetic narratives. And I think this connects to your artistic as a patron of monastic asceticism, visionary practices. Uh, I have, uh, when I did my studies on this uh, text, I have checked all the texts, but I could not find any relation. But perhaps I should do it again, uh, because. Um, this time in the wilderness is a preparation to becoming a priest. So he makes also liturgical uh, experiences and when Abraham comes, in the end, uh, they perform together a real offer. So it could have to do something, which I, but I don't have the text uh, really before my eyes now. I should have that. Yes, I, should check it again, and I would be thankful for some bibliographical things. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have time for other questions. Then